Good example and welcome to season two of Queer Talks. I am Nam Gizam. With me today is a very popular face, Regita Gurum, and she's here to talk about what it means to be a cisgender bisexual woman, right? So <coughs> tell me, what does it mean to be a cisgender bisexual woman? Um, so I think before that, I'd just like to uh, put a disclaimer that whatever I will be sharing would be from my own experience. Mm. So for the audience not to generalize that with the other people who might identify with the same mm. gender identity as I do or the sexual identity. Mm -hmm. So for me, what it means to be a cisgender bisexual woman is that so I was assigned a sex at birth, right? And that was female. And at the moment, my gender identity, I, that is in alignment with that. Mm. But in terms of my sexuality or my sexual orientation, mm. I, I, I identify as a bisexual woman because I believe I'm attracted to more than one gender. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so that is what it means to be a cisgender bisexual woman. For so me. How, how did you discover that you were bisexual? What was that journey? So my journey of discovering my uh, sexual identity was not something that I was voluntarily a part of growing up. But a few years ago when I was doing my gender studies minor, mm. I had to do this activity of like reflecting back and doing a first ethnography, retracing some of the episodes of my life, trying to deconstruct what society had uh, uh, assigned me as. Mm -hmm. So when I did that, I realized that uh, my culture environment from a very young age played a big role in my journey. Mm -hmm. So if I am to narrate that, so I was born in the late 90s, early 2000. Mm. So that time when family planning was rather very like popular, mm. and the perfect family model was like a heterosexual couple, mm. like a, uh, a father, mother, and two children, mm. like a boy, Preferably a boy and a girl. Yes. Yeah. So my sister happened to be the elder one. So mm. when I was uh, born, my mom wanted to actually have a boy child. I see. So because uh, so when I was born, my mom wanted me to um, be a boy child. That is why she would dress me as. A stereotypically like a boy child dressing. How interesting. Yes, with like even my haircut. It was I like think very I remember short. reading this on your Instagram story yes. once, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. So I had very short hair mm. and again that's stereotypically for like a boy child's mm. hairstyle. Mm. And I was even given toys that are again for stereotypically boy children, mm. like guns and toys and trucks. <laughs> when my sister was given like Barbies and kitchen sets. Interesting. But I mean I never had a problem with that and I'm not complaining. But what happened is like after a few years, when I was about to hit puberty, mm. I was suddenly asked to act more feminine, act like mm. a girl. Mm. So now that transition is something that I was not voluntarily asked for. Right. And I never had the agency to decide. Mm -hmm. So for me, that transition was rather difficult, but I never thought I could question it. Mm. So when I was hitting my puberty and when you have these initial stages of feeling for people, mm. I remember now that I actually had crushes for like girls as well. <laughs> but these are feelings mm. that I thought were fleeting moments and that, mm. that were shameful. Mm. and I never even confronted them before because mm. I thought I never could mm. because all my life I was assigned I was told how to act mm -hmm. even if that means as a child I was told to act like a boy mm. and uh, growing up I was told to act like a girl I was put into this gender roles mm -hmm. by my family or my culture environment mm. so I never thought that uh, in terms of my sexual orientation also I had the agency to decide mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so it wasn't until a few years ago that when I reflected I realized that I was always attracted to like more than one gender meaning I was also attracted to my own gender mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. but I never could address it before mm -hmm. so I think I came um, to into this uh, conversation with my own self where, where I confronted all these feelings that I had as a child or a teenager mm -hmm. only in my uh, like um, late teenage life and I think that's when I was able to say that yes confidently say that yes I am attracted to my gender as well and that I'm a bisexual woman so mm -hmm. I think that was how my journey went about mm. how did you find the vocabulary though to um, recognize this in yourself so I think for that I'm very really grateful for my education because mm. I was studying in a liberal arts university full, uh, full of like women from all over the world <laughs> and professors who are very like woke and very empowering mm. so I took gender studies as a minor so in that what we do is the very first thing we do is learn the terminologies mm. and I remember at first being very confused because these are very new topic uh, terms right. for me mm -hmm. even the word gender although I knew <laughs> about it and I did have people friends from the LGBTQIA plus community mm. I never I knew the details of it mm -hmm. so and I never knew that uh, these were terms that would be applicable to me as well mm -hmm. like I was always accepting of people who would use these uh, terms mm -hmm. but I never thought I had to mm -hmm. so but in my like my classes I was able to learn them through mm -hmm. a very detailed manner mm -hmm. and also like from a very feminist perspective right so it allowed me to also like uh, uh, like um, apply those knowledge in my own life mm -hmm. and to, in my own journey mm -hmm. so that's how I came to know about the terminology and like I said for me 
I think after that, I had plenty of time and a safe space amongst my friend circle, amongst my university friends and professors to explore my own identity. Mm. And I think that's how I and I'm now confident to say that, yes, at the moment, I am a bisexual woman. Mm. Have you had this conversation with your mother or your family? Uh, so unfortunately not. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, yes, I have told my family, uh, my close-knit circle that, yes, I like girls as well, mm. but they don't take me seriously. <laughs> because right? I, yes. It, that's the thing, right? Like, I also want to talk about mm. this. like. Now, especially because you've done gender studies, yes. and I think you're sensitized to this yes. and you're aware that when a man says mm. this, they tend to be taken a little more seriously than a girl. They'd be like, oh, it's just mm. a fleeting yes. thing, like it's a phase, yes. you'll grow out of it. So I think that's the reaction you're getting as well. Yes, also because I was dating, I am dating a heterosexual cisgendered man, right? <laughs> so they think I am just trying to be a rebel. Right. Like. No, this, and you know what? Um, after you shared this with uh, Pema, one of the founders mm -hmm. of Queer Voices of Bhutan, he was talking about how it's so interesting that even within the community, people want to box you in, right? Like because you identify as bisexual, the assumption is that you you should have dated or yes. should be dating both men and women, right? How do you how do you react to this? Uh, so like you said, because I've been sensitized and I've learned, mm. I've, uh, I've studied about it. I am, I think now I have a thick skin and I understand where this uh, perception is coming from. Mm. But uh, what I understand about sexual orientation is that there are almost like three constructs, like that is the identity, attraction, and your behavior. Mm -hmm. And they don't always have to be in alignment. Mm. And even in terms of attraction, it doesn't always have to be sexual. Mm -hmm. It can also be romantic or emotional. Mm -hmm. So I know what I feel. And just because I'm not acting upon it does not mean that I am any less of a bisexual woman mm -hmm. and what people perceive a bisexual woman to be. Mm. But again, at the same time, I feel like there's this amazing quote about how if you're visibly queer, you face more discrimination. Mm -hmm. And in my case, because I'm not visibly queer, because I am dating a cisgender heterosexual men, mm. right? And I, in terms of my gender also, I an identify as a cisgender woman. Mm. I understand that I have not faced the wrath of it or mm. like the discrimination in such an extreme level. Mm. So with that comes the privilege that I have to accept. Mm -hmm. And this like your self-awareness. Yes. And also, I like that you bring in the word privilege, yes. right? That the privilege you've come to. This Was this a realization that, this is a self-realization? or was there somebody who you had a conversation with who pointed mm -hmm. that out to you? Uh, so I think in a way it was both self-realization and something that I was, uh, I think shared, up, uh, I think my friends and my professors shared this with me. And the reason is because I think, so like when I like tried to retrace my uh, journey of mm -hmm. my sexual orientation, I did feel a bit bad about myself. Mm. Because, like I said, I did not have the agency to decide mm. upon who mm. I was course, or right, to right. even like uh, confront it. Mm. But then, uh, when I was doing that, I realized I was in my own bubble too. That mm. I, because I had also not faced a lot of discrimination, mm. that's why I could not understand. And that's why I never felt the need to even like speak up about it mm. before. Mm -hmm. right? So, in a way, that bec uh, in a way it was good and bad for me because mm. I was, there were some uh, doubts in myself. But they were not extreme and mm. because they were not extreme or like upfront for the people to notice it mm. people did not uh, you know uh, discriminate me because of it so i remember hearing my friends stories as well bisexual women of color but i remember how their stories took a different turn for them especially in the societies they live in mm. which is different than mine the mm. cultural context as well and i realized then and there that i did have a lot of privilege being not visible in terms of my queerness mm -hmm. how how fascinating like even when you talk about attraction you know like when you yeah. sexuality i think this is something that we can delve into even further mm. because it, it isn't just about a conversation here in this interview but it goes beyond this interview i think if, if people want to explore if you want to ask mm. regita more questions she is on instagram and she's very active mm. and i'm sure you're more than happy to yes. take these questions right um also your relationship right now you're saying you're in a relationship with a heterosexual man yes. how does he feel about your sexual mm. orientation <clears throat> so this is actually my first romantic partner also so mm. Uh, and I, I dated him when I was 17, so mm. it's been like almost six years. Wow. So in the six years, I think we have crossed that level of like understanding each other to the point that now we are very respectful of each other. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I always felt comfortable in tel telling him everything that I felt, everything mm. that I learned as well. Mm. So in terms of my sexual orientation as well, I remember having this conversation in our early stages of our relationship. Mm. That time I had no label for myself, <laughs> but I did tell him that I was like, and I'm so sorry if this word is problematic, but I, I always said I'd like to experiment because mm. at that time I did not know. Mm -hmm. But I think after like almost like three, four years, like two years ago, mm. I remember having this serious conversation with him whereby I was actually crying because I was talking about how in my own label that I have for my uh, sexual orientation, I did not feel like I can come out mm -hmm. because like I said, of the privileges and like all of that at the same time, I didn't think it was right for me to come out when there are people going to worse. 
So you felt like a little bit of an imposter. Yes. Did you feel I that? Did. Yeah, the imposter I, yes. syndrome, right? Yeah, I right. feel like I do not belong. So mm. I remember crying about it and mm. saying how I don't think I have people like that I can talk about this like, openly, on, mm. uh, like except for my university friends, mm. which are not in my like community, right, in Bhutan. <laughs> right. Uh, but then th this is where Ziga, my boyfriend said this, and I am really grateful because he said this that. Uh, he was like very accepting number one and i think i remember the quote very well but at the moment i might paraphrase it he was like regita you know i want you to be confident in yourself and i want you to continue your journey of exploring yourself and even and even if that means that sometime in the future that might not be with me mm. i'll be always there for you oh sweet uh, for me that <laughs> was the first time in my entire life that somebody actually you know really accepted me mm. and said that they'll be there for me and, and made you feel valid yes. like what yes. you were feeling was valid right yes. oh you're so lucky to be in a relationship with somebody like that yes and that's why i think he's more like i say that he's my best friend too right i think that's i think a key component yes. of what makes a relationship really strong and what makes it work right you were saying how you were crying mm. i also want to touch upon the mental health aspect yes. you were saying how your mental health was at odds yes. with you coming out do you yes. want to share this with us Yes, I do, I think. But, uh, so I never thought again, like I said, because I never had uh, a lot of, I think, traumatic experiences as a child or in my teenage life because of my sexual orientation because I was not visible. Mm -hmm. But I did not realize that that had an impact on my psychological health mm. because inside I always felt like an imposter. Like mm. I did not belong in one community or the other. Mm -hmm. And I did not know where I belonged. Mm. And I think as a teenager, especially as a young person, you want to always feel like you belong of somewhere. Course, of course. You want to feel valid. You, mm. wanna, you want yourself to be validated by people around you. <laughs> but in my case, people mm. took me as a joke if I ever said I was like, you know, a bisexual woman mm. or they thought I was trying to be like, you know, a rebel. Like mm. I was but this is the other extreme, yes. right? For you, like, let me just cut in a yes. little bit um, uh, because um, other people have this fear of coming out yes. because they don't want to be judged yes. for who they are. But for you, you knew who you were, but you couldn't come up because you felt that you were going to be judged yes. for that. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Especially when you're very young mm. you want to have a safe space a mm. community that you can talk to and even if these are fleeting moments like you once can always say it or even if these are like phases of one's life mm. one wants to always have that safe space to talk about it like you know comfortably mm. which I did not have mm. and I again I also thought like because of the privileges that I had faced because mm. of my invisible queerness mm. I thought if I was to speak up now I would be taking the spotlight from the others mm. so I thought I was also being a privileged brat in my mind like where I'm not okay with not being discriminated like where mm. I was like I thought I was trying to g get unnecessary attention on myself mm. you know when I shouldn't and when mm. I, when the attention attention should be to others who are going to worse mm -hmm. so that was a battle that I had with myself and I think that also affected my confidence in my own self or the trust that I had in my own self which mm -hmm. in terms of mental health that's not good right because when you lose trust from your own self yeah you question you question your yeah. worth and your value mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. your everything else mm -hmm. so for me that I think had a major implication in my life and like I said even having this conversation with my boyfriend where, where, where I broke down mm. it was traumatic in a way because I realized I never had somebody like that to talk with mm -hmm. I mean yes I did have my university friends and my professors but again they uh, were not part of my community that I like you know mm. in Bhutan yeah, and he's not part of your gender studies yes, group, group yes. <laughs> who's sensitized yes. but he's just like that as a person so yes. I think that must have come as such a relief and like so refreshing for you right yes it gave me a hope that you know yes there is somebody in my own community somebody mm. i know somebody who's just a human mm. and somebody who can understand mm -hmm. and then also made me realize that my experience is valid mm -hmm. and i'm not saying that we need to seek validation mm. but i think it is uh, important to get validation time and again to just mm. you know reassure yourself of your mm. journey and your identity is this why you decided you wanted to come out um that is one reason mm. and the second is because like i said um since a young age, I went through this uh, phases of being assigned to gender role or mm. to perform in a certain manner, mm. but I never had the agency to. Mm. And I realized that there's a lot of people like me. Mm -hmm. And especially, I think, in our society where we don't talk about it, which has its privileges or the pros, right? Because right? you don't face like covert or overt discrimination. Mm. But at the same time, I think this confuses a lot of us because we never think we have the agency to even question to explore mm. to understand our own selves mm. so, we, so we never do that and i realized that in my case yes it might not have been extreme but i'm sure there are many of people many people like me who might be having the same questions in their mind but mm. they think they can't find the answer to because they're not supposed to mm. so i think we need to remove that uh, narrative of you know imposing um uh, imposing the identity of somebody to somebody directly mm. by society mm. and we should rather give them the agency to decide mm -hmm.
How interesting. I think even your journey, even though like you were saying, your invisible queerness would make it simplistic, yes. but I think it's been complex yes. for you as well, like what you've shared with yes. me in the short, mm. short span of time that we've had together on this interview. After you've come out, um, did you, I mean, you ex expected some kind of discrimination before you came out. Yes. And after you did come out, was that kind of expected, uh, expected discrimination in your life? Did it appear or um, have things remained the same? And how are your friends around you? How are people you know around you before you became the regular you are right now? Uh, so in terms of the expectation from, uh, I mean, in terms of the reaction from people around mm. me, I think it is what I had expected. They don't take me seriously. Still? They don't. <laughs> people <laughs> laugh. They're like, are you, no, you're not. Right. Stop joking. Right. Or like, oh my God. Like, is that what feminism is right mm. now? They, I don't know why they do that, but in a way coming out was for my own self, mm. where I was validating my own experience, mm. my own identity. Mm. So I no longer care about mm. the reactions. Mm. I, know, I now know that uh, even if I get such reactions, I am confident in my own self. Mm. And I think this confidence is what I received from coming out. And that's, mm. that's enough or that's mm. worth all the other reaction that might come along. But then now you have friends in your queer, in the queer community who are telling you, Regita, just because you're bisexual, it's not necessary for you to have a female, mm. like to like another woman or to be in a relationship with another woman. And does that feel you, does that make you feel a little bit better? <laughs> it does, it does. It makes me feel like I can be who I want to be. And mm. even if that means that in the future I might change mm. because I don't know, like I always say that I'm still exploring. So although I'm confident in my own identity at the moment, I now have given myself the chance and the space to explore further mm. and to know that there are people around me, my friends, who, mm. ha who are also giving me the same space to mm. explore mm. and who will accept me and the, peop the person I become in the future. I think that's always like very encouraging for one when one explores. Mm -hmm. How do you see things um, for yourself in the future mm. now, going forward from here? Uh, so. I think the, f I, um, the first thing that I told my gender studies professor when I was taking gender studies was that I'm confused. Mm. And when I came out of my gender studies class after four years... Even I more confused? <laughs> I said, I'm more confused. <laughs> yes. And uh, that's when my professor, said, uh, my professor said this, that is the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. that, you ca you, that you will never stop learning about mm. yourself and the people around you and mm. all these constructs and all these ideas. Mm. And so for me, going forward, I don't know what, I, what will happen. All I know is that I am willing to accept it mm. and I know I'll be enjoying learning and unlearning a lot of things about my own self and about mm. society as gen mm. in, a gen in general. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in this process also discomfort is uh, uh, part and parcel yes. of it, right? But the fact that you are self-aware, yes. um, you've made the self-discovery, you've made this journey so far where now you feel that you are free from these labels and you don't need that kind of external validation all the time to, um, uh, to celebrate who you are as a person, I think is so fantastic and your journey is so different. And I hope that everybody who's watched this conversation between Regita and myself feels inspired by it like I am because prior to this I would follow Regita on Instagram but she's just Regita you know this little girl who grew up in front of my <laughs> eyes as a model and now when I sit with her and I was like wow she's really grown because she's like she's saying things that I that I say to myself have conversations every day and there's a part of you I have not seen and I don't think you show it much on social media either so then I think you should show this part of social media of yourself on social media more as well because I think you have so many young people who follow you I think it would be so interesting for them uh, to understand and see your experience right I think and you never know there might be some somebody out there mm -hmm. who it will resonate with, right? So I hope that can happen. So along with uh, this uncertainty about my future, but at the same time confidence, I have this group of friends uh, from a university that I call my safe space. And what I love about our friendship is that we learn from each other. And that means that we have these finsters where we share all our experiences, our knowledge, even if that is sexual experiences or this uh, the gender identities and all of that, everything that they are confronted with, even like if that's like assault or traumas, we share it with each other so that we learn from each other. And I think that was very important and that is very important for me because that means I am learning not only within my own uh, realm of reality, but rather also from my friends who are living in a different society, mm. you know, facing different uh, realities. But it makes me uh, be more, I think, conscious and also at the same time alert and mm. um, mindful and also allows me to grow more. Mm -hmm. Well, that's wonderful. I hope that you continue down this path, being this self-aware, this self-accepting, celebratory of who you are. Um, uh, your journey is so complex, so fascinating, and it's not 
as people would think, oh, such a simplistic mm. journey, you know, for her, it wasn't. And I'm um, thankful that you shared your journey with us and to everybody who's uh, watched this interview. Um, Queer Voices of Bhutan is thankful as well, and they have this little goodie bag for you. It's, it's grown in size since our last season. <laughs> it's, it's a huge bag. So we hope that you like whatever's inside the bag. Even for I me, would. it's a surprise. It's a lot of goodies. Um, we want to thank the Embassy of Canada to Bhutan for sponsoring the second season of Queer Talks. We want to thank you for your love and support. Keep loving and supporting the queer community in Bhutan. Thank you.